Okay, hi guys, welcome back to my channel. So in today's video, I'm gonna be presenting a template for a audit slash review planning memo. Um, and the purpose of this is to save you time, but also energy when you have to complete one of these um, in a case. And it's basically gonna allow you to take off everything the markers need to get a C in each of the uh, four AOs that are normally associated with it. So in the first part of this video, it's just going to be me sitting here. I'm going to be giving a brief uh, introduction to the audit slash review planning memo. Um, then in the second part of the video, I'm going to have a few uh, rubrics slash feedback guides up on the screen. And for each of the uh, four components of the audit slash review planning memo, I'm going to be identifying similarities in these feedback guides across cases uh, with the goal of actually just boiling down what do you actually need to include every single time in order to get the marks. And then I'm going to take that and move into the third part of the video where I'm actually going to present the template, um, which you can use literally every single time. So I'm going to have that up on the screen and I'm going to be walking through it and giving a few other tips uh, just kind of along the way. Okay guys, so let's jump right into it. Um, so here I'm going to talk about the general attack plan for an audit slash review planning memo. Um, something I want to say first before I even start is that uh, your financial reporting issues, that analysis impacts your materiality calculation and it also impacts um, your choice of procedure. So while you can set up the template um, really at the very start of your case and just kind of get that work out of the way, you can't actually populate your materiality calculation or your procedures table until you have done your financial reporting analysis first. Um, with the reason being that your FR, you're going to have journal entries or adjustments as a result of your analysis, and those are going to impact um, the income statement and balance sheet, which is going to, you need the adjusted figure when you calculate your mater materiality, okay? And um, your choice of procedures is also impacted by what your financial reporting issues were. So um, yeah, you can set this template up at the very start at any time, but you cannot actually populate it until you have done your financial reporting analysis. Another really important note here is that in some cases you will be asked specifically to do one component of the uh, planning memo. So you might be asked specifically just to do procedures or you might be asked specifically just to calculate materiality. But if you're just generally asked to do an audit slash review planning memo, these are the components that you need to hit. Okay, so there's four main components that should be in your attack plan. And I use a little like acronym to remember these, which is MRAP, M-R-A-P. So that's materiality, um, risk assessment, <laughs> approach, and then procedures. So we're gonna uh, proceed through a very short description now of those four main components to a planning memo. Okay guys, so my very brief introduction here to the four components before I get uh, further into them in parts two and three of this video. So materiality, this is where you're doing a little bit of uh, multiplication. You're gonna have your overall materiality, you're gonna have your performance materiality, which is 50% um, of your overall materiality. But um, I think the part that a lot of people miss in their materiality subsection is um, identifying the users and their sensitivities and um, their needs, like what, do they, what are they actually using the financial statements for, um, and then how does that impact what's important to them. Um, so materiality uh, will be covered super in depth as to how to calculate that in part two and three. So then um, risk assessment, that's risk at the overall financial statement level. Um, so. I think a lot of people get confused about risk at the account level versus risk at the financial statement level. Um, risk at the account level is actually more like what you're looking at in your financial reporting, like when it comes down to it. Um, you're looking at kind of threats to the accurate representation of account balances. Um, when we're talking about risk at the overall financial statement level, this is more kind of environmental stuff. Um, so this might be something that's happening uh, in the control environment. This might be something that's happening with management specifically. Um, and in, in a case situation, when you have to conclude on risk at the overall financial statement level, it's, it's rarely going to be lower than medium because it's a case, like there's issues going on and that's why it's a case, otherwise there would be nothing to talk about. So generally it's gonna be medium or high um, when you, cause you do have to actually conclude on that as we'll see in part two, that's one of the things that shows up in the feedback guides um, for risk assessment. 
So then we move on to approach. Um, and when we're looking at approach, we're basically choosing between substantive or combined. And the main thing that impacts this is um, control risk. If, if uh, we're confident in the control system, then we're generally going to go with more of an analytical approach, whereas substantive is when we're a little less comfortable um, with the control environment. Something really important here um, that people are really prone to getting wrong is if it's a review planning memo, it's always um, combined, like analytical really. And that's actually like what the difference between a um, audit and a review is, is that audit you're doing like in-depth substantive testing, whereas review it's analytical testing only. Um, and we'll see, we'll kind of come back to this when we talk about procedures. So, um, yeah, the procedure section, uh, what people mostly lose marks on here is that they're not um, giving like a broad enough description of the situation. So in my template, um, I use a table with columns to make sure I tick off each of the things that the markers are looking for. Um, so identifying the account, the specific risk to the account, what the assertion is, and then the procedure to address that identified risk. Whereas a lot of people, they don't give enough, enough like depth there and they just state the procedure and then the um, markers have to give them like a partial instead of a yes, basically. Um, so we'll see that table that I use uh, in part three. Um, but I wanted to note here that this is where we see the biggest uh, difference between a audit planning memo and a review planning memo. Um, is that in a review, you're only doing analytical procedures. So um, your procedures, you're not going to be doing things like uh, recalculating, like observing, etc. You only can discuss slash inquire and do analytical procedures. Audit, you can do everything, obviously, right? Review, you have to keep it to those two verbs or it's going to basically indicate to the markers that you don't know the difference between a review and an audit. Um, they basically have to give you zero for procedures, like you, that's an automatic NC if you cannot recognize that difference. Okay, so now that we've identified and talked on a very light level about the four components, um, M, R, A, P, now we're going to look at some rubrics um, to find out what exactly the markers are looking for. And, and you'll see when you look at the rubrics, they're looking for the exact same thing every time, right? So why not set up a format that's gonna work every single time? So here we go. Okay guys, so now we're going to launch into the second part of this video and what we're aiming to do here is to look at the uh, feedback guide slash rubrics that were provided for a few cases which had audit slash review planning memos in them and we're going to identify similarities across these rubrics um, with the goal of seeing what do we really need to do each time in order to pick up all the necessary marks to get straight C's and then based off of those um, similarities across the rubrics from various cases that we see, we're going to then build the template, which I will be showing in part three. So the goal here is um, really to identify what are they giving marks for every single time, um, and then how can I lay this out to present it in the uh, way that's going to be the easiest and quickest for me possible, and kind of minimize the innovative thought during it to save energy and time. So we'll start here by looking at a few rubrics that were provided um, to mark the materiality section of an audit planning memo. Here we go, I'll zoom in a bit here. So, okay, so I think I have three, yeah, I have three different materiality uh, marking rubrics here. And when we look at these, we see that it's actually the exact same thing every time. Um, we look at row one, it's the exact same as row one here. Row two, exact same thing as row two here. Um, and here it's a little bit different just because approach is included in this one, but in this case it's row three and row four. It's the exact same prompts every single time that they're marking you with. So when we um, summarize the requirements of these three completely different materiality marking uh, AOs, from feedback guides, we can boil it down to four things that you need to do for materiality every single time. First, you need to assess the users, their needs, and their sensitivities. And um, to get a yes, you need to discuss two users, as we can see right here. Um, 
if you just identify the two, you're going to get a partial. You need to discuss them, um, implementing case facts uh, to get the full yes. Then you move on to identifying your appropriate materiality base to use, and it, you have to link it back to the users. Um, how do we know that? Because it tells us in the rubric for every single time they mark it. It's not really novel. It's um, especially for the materiality component. It's very uh, routinized. Um, okay, then number three, we need to explain what is an appropriate materiality percentage to use. Um, again, we have to relate it back to the users. Um, we see this again in every single rubric. And then lastly, for materiality, we need to actually do the calculation, um, and it has to be consistent with our analysis above. So, uh, for example, depending on what materiality base that we selected with our reasoning, we have to make sure that we actually use that materiality base for the calculation. Okay, so now that we've looked at the shared characteristics of three completely different um, materiality AOs from a couple of feedback guides. Now we'll move on to the next part of the um, audit slash review planning memo, which is the overall financial statement risk assessment. And again, I have three, three of those. So taking a quick glance at this one, moving on to this one. Again, we see that it's the exact same layout um, for the markers every single time. So when we summarize those similarities, we can again identify what we need to do every single time. So we need to um, identify risk factors and we need to discuss them. So they elaborate on what discussing a risk factor means. Um, we need to identify the risk factor. We need to mention or explain how it impacts risk. And then we need to categorize that impact, um, meaning does it increase or decrease risk. And we see that Something that they like to include in the marking rubric here and here, for example, is that they want you to include at least one factor that increases risk and at least one factor that decreases risk to show a balanced analysis. So again, um, here we need six factors discussed for yes, but normally it's four or five. Um, so here you need five factors discussed, here you need six, and then here you need four. So in general, four to six, um, I'll change that to six, you would discuss in order to get yes. And then the next thing you need to do based on these rubrics um, during your risk assessment is to provide a supported conclusion on the overall financial statement level risk. Um, see that's number three, number three, and number two in this case of how you need to pick up marks. Um, generally it's going to be at least moderate um, just because, because in a case there kind of has to be quite a few risk factors going on or it wouldn't really be a case because there'd be nothing to talk about. But anyway, so you take what you talked about here and then you provide your supported conclusion. If you do these two steps, then every single time you're going to um, tick off what they need to give you marks basically. So then we move on to the next component of the audit slash review planning memo and this is the approach. So here I have, I only have two rubrics because um, these were a little bit harder for me to find in past cases that I had written. So when we uh, compare these two rubrics and we're looking for similarities, um, the, the uh, marking requirements for the approach component are very minimal. So in this case, it's just this little thing before. This is about procedures. Just this is for the, for the approach. And then just these two are for approach. So it's very easy to boil that down into what we really need to do for approach every time. We need to discuss the approach with, when they say discuss, they tell you exactly what they mean. Um, they want you to identify the approach, whether it's combined or substantive, and they want you to provide case facts um, as support. I'm going to elaborate a little bit more um, in the other parts of the video regarding how to really do a good approach section. You don't need to do much, but you want it to be good. Um, or they're, they're going to want to give you a partial, really, not a yes. So then you need to provide a conclusion on the approach. You can't just do a little discussion and move on. You need to say, because of this, we're going to go with either combined or substantive and definitively uh, state for the reader what you have selected your approach to be. So this is probably the most minimal one, very little that you have to do to pick up the marks. 
then we go to the uh, last section of the audit slash review planning memo, which is the procedures. So here is three rubrics um, that they use in different cases to mark the procedures. And here, they're, uh, these are case specific, right? These are specific things from the cases that they would expect a candidate to complete procedures on. But what we're really looking at here that's most important is this section here. And this is where they're telling you exactly uh, how they want you to do it every time, irrelevant of the um, case specific facts. This is how you need to write your procedures every single time to pick up marks. So they want you to identify the risk to misstatement and what the relevant assertion is. They tell you that right here. They want you to explain why it's a risk. They tell you that right here. And then they want you to provide specific and clear audit procedures that correspond to the identified risk. And they tell you that right here. So a lot of people are really concerned, like, well, how many procedures do I need to give? And there's not a clear rule because it depends on the case and how many um, really like crucial or central risks there are. But in this case, they want you to do two complete rows with a complete row, meaning you ticked off all of these components. They want you to do two here. In this case, they wanted you to do four. Uh, in this case, they wanted you to do three. So um, that's why I wrote two to four complete rows. But yeah, so in the template, um, in the next part of this video, I'm going to show a table that I use to make sure that I tick off those components um, for each of my lines to make sure that they counted as a complete row. Okay guys, so now we are in part three of this video where I'm actually going to present the template that I created um, based off of looking at that, those variety of rubrics. Um, so what this is, is basically a format um, that I would use every single time. Um, and because of that, I could absolutely power through an audit slash review planning memo um, with very little time and very little effort. So here we go. So for materiality, oh yeah, I wanted to note anything that's in black text means that I would literally use that exact same text every single time. So yes, I would type this out every single time. Um, I guess I basically had it memorized uh, to a certain extent. So I would um, go to that applicable section in my case response and absolutely like pound out this entire template and then I would basically like fill in the blank. So where I have the red bold font is where it actually varies between cases. Other than that, my answer is like 99% the exact same every single time. So for materiality, as we um, learn from looking through the rubrics, these are the components that I need to tick off to get the marks. Um, this is not like entirely necessary. I just uh, included that if I had time because it just shows that I like really, really, really knew what I was talking about. Um, so, yeah, this is case specific. I can't really elaborate on this, but the base for materiality, so this depends on um, your entity. So, are you for profit or is it not for profit? If it's not for profit, you're going to be using total revenue or total expenses and your percentage is going to be 0.5 to 2%. Um, now, if you're a profit oriented entity, it depends whether you're in an income position or a loss position. So um, if it's profit oriented and it is profitable, you'll generally use a normalized net income before tax. Uh, for your base and you'll generally use five to ten percent for your percentage if it's profit oriented but in a loss position then you're probably going to use total revenue um, or total assets and then you're going to use 0 0.5 to 2 percent and that's the same percentage that you would be using for a not-for-profit um, when using total revenue or total expenses so yeah you're plugging in these figures um, as i said in part one i i complete the whole template first in order but I you don't go back to plug in the figures until after you've done your procedures because you need to do the um, adjusted uh, materiality base whether that's revenue whether that whether that's assets whether that's net income or tax you need to adjust that based on your 
uh, procedures and any journal entries resulting from your um, financial reporting. Sorry, that's what I meant actually. <laughs> uh, not procedures, but when you're doing your financial reporting analysis and then you finish with a journal entry, it's going to impact those figures, whether it's a balance sheet account or an income statement account. So then you uh, plug those all in. Now we'll look at risk. So to tick off the components that the markers need based on the rubrics that we looked at to give marks, um, to assess risk of the overall financial statement level, we're going to have, so you're going to have several rows here, right? Um, however many it is, uh, let's say you have four, you're going to have four rows. And um, you're going to identify the factor, you're going to explain how it impacts risk, and then you're going to categorize it uh, as whether it increases or decreases, and that helps them give you the mark for the balanced analysis when they said they wanted at least one that increases risk and at least one that decreases risk. This just makes it really easy for them to give you that mark there. And then remember, the rubrics tell you you have to conclude. So that's where you fill in this. Um, so this is what I would consider to be like 100% necessary. This part was just kind of like a flex, something that I learned uh, in my graduate diploma is um, I would plug this in after I'd completed my procedures. And let's say I had five procedures, um, I would list the accounts slash assertions that those apply to right here and just type this. It's black text, so that's literally what I typed every single time was that sentence. Um, and it just shows that you're able to differentiate between risk at the overall financial statement level and risk at the assertion slash account level. Again, this is the crucial part. Based on the rubrics that we looked at, um, that's the bare minimum to pick up the marks. So now we move on to whoops, the next component which is approach. This is a very minimal section, so my template for it is very minimal. Um, but because your selection of your approach basically entirely depends on the control risk assessment, I start off with that. Um, I discuss and then conclude on the level of control risk, and then I go into the approach, uh, and then I go into the implications of the approach. I'm just even having these two little sections kind of make sure that I'm going to be able to pick up those marks in that very minimal uh, feedback guide grid for for this section. Um, so, yeah, approach, I mean, we're really going between substantive or combined. Um, substantive is when your control risk is high and then combined is when your control risk is low. Um, just wanted to mention a couple other things that are good to consider in approach. Um, just apart from like straight up control risk, if you want to go a little bit more in depth in your discussion, like in this section, um, you might want to consider things like, is it a first time audit? If so, you're going to need to test opening balances. Um, you might need to talk about timing of the audit or specific tests. Like, is there a tight deadline? Is there a need to surprise um, a certain department? Um, we might need to say something about the prior auditor if this is a first-time client, but not a first-time audit. Uh, we might need to say something about specific staffing requirements or if there's an expert needed, like if valuation is a really critical issue in the case or something. Uh, we might need to say something about um, location, like is there multiple operating locations that we need to visit. Um, and yeah, so we'll move on to the procedures part of the template here. So again, this is one where you would be inserting rows uh, for each procedure. And based on how they told us that they mark the procedures, we know that we need to identify the account. We need to state what the specific risk is in relation to that account balance. Uh, we need to identify what the assertion is. Um, and then we need to actually provide the procedures. So I always use this table with this kind of acronym, I say ARAP, A-R-A-P, I don't know. Um, and doing this means that you're going to have a complete procedure section every time. So how they, uh, what they refer to that as in the rubric is a complete row. It means that you get a yes, not a partial. Um, so yeah, the specific account risks, these usually come up from the financial reporting issues that you did. So you always want to do financial reporting first. Um, and let's say you have four financial reporting issues and you did all your analysis for them, you're going to want to put all four here um, and then discuss the audit implications of them. 
but sometimes it's not sometimes not all the procedures they're looking for come from financial reporting issues sometimes they're going to be looking for procedures based on um, like other common triggers related to account risk. So this could be things like uh, new classes of transactions during the year, uh, implementation of new systems or business processes during the year, um, or like significant variances or changes in ratios between years. Like if they just straight up provide you with a draft financial statement and you see a massive increase um, in a certain account balance from the pri uh, previous year to the current year, whether or not there was a financial uh, reporting issue related to that, you should probably do a procedure on it. Um, it shows that you like really looked at the financial statements and that you identified the fact that uh, that's abnormal, which shows a deep level of understanding. So when you're um, designing the procedure, meaning filling in this column, this, this is kind of a good thing to remember, is that you want an object and you want a verb. So first, for the object, it's like you're going to want to maybe obtain a piece of documentation, um, like something that supports the balance that you're looking at. So that might be something like a uh, asset valuation that the company obtained uh, from a contractor during the year. It might be something like uh, AR detail. And then with the object that you have specifically identified, you want a verb, right? So you want to perform your audit tests on that identified object slash documentation by comparing it with support. So you might be recalculating, you might be vouching to invoices, you might be inspecting terms, etc. So I'll just lightly scroll through this one more time. I have a blank page there, whoops. But so again, guys, here's the template. This, it ticks off every single thing they're looking for to give you marks. The black text is identical every single time. You're literally just plugging in figures. Again, I use this table with these headings every single time. Um, it makes the marker's job easy to present it this way because they're not skimming through like random paragraph style text being like, okay, wait, so do they say it increases or decreases? You literally have it as increases risk or decreases risk uh, in a specific column for them. And your conclusion, you put it in a line on its own. There we go. They can give you a yes on that right there. Approach. The simple one, you do your control risk assessment and you then you discuss other factors in the case and you conclude on your approach. Procedures, you identify the account, risk, the assertion, and then you provide the procedure based on an object with a verb. Okay guys, so I hope this was really helpful. Um, this worked incredibly well for me to the point where when I saw an auditor review planning memo, I would be excited because I knew that I was going to be getting straight like C's on a, basically three or four AOs minimum. Um, and I hope that using this can make you guys feel the same way. So I want to thank you guys a lot for watching this video. And please note that I have, I think, three other CFE related videos up on my channel right now. Um, I would really appreciate if you guys would check that out. Best of luck on the exam and I'll see you guys next time.